Okay, we are recording this uh, meeting of the VDM Mastermind team, the insider team that is helping the VMR Research Foundation to uh, bring on and develop the uh, research and development uh, in the high floaters uh, research. My name is Fabio Gallerani. I'm the, I, the founder with Dr. Sebag of the VDM project, a project uh, born uh, that aim to connect the sufferers worldwide with uh, doctors like Dr. Sebag that aim to find a less invasive uh, solution and better solution to treat and uh, cure eye floaters, uh, which we know is a very, very uh, bad condition to have in the eye and is afflicting many, many people around the world. So the aim of this meeting is um, <clears throat> to celebrate, first of all, our first target achieved, we aim to raise $10,000 per month and we achieved the target in the month of December 2020 and January 2021. So we aim to increase the target in order to let uh, Dr. Sebag and the foundation uh, and all the network around the research to receive funding from people like me and you watching these videos that uh, want to support uh, the research in this field uh, in the past years uh, uh, many people tried uh, uh, what we are trying now but uh, this time as i always say we have uh, a beautiful connection with the medical world with dr sebag which in my opinion is the main expert worldwide about vitreous and not just in my opinion but is recognized as a medical in the medical community so dr sebag i'm gonna hand the mic to you and um uh, just to uh, a quick preview, Dr. Sebag will uh, share with us all the recent development and achievements. And at the end of this session, we will do a brief Q&A. So um, let's start. Dr. Sebag, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, okay. I, appreciate, I appreciate everyone uh, for joining us this morning. And I want to express my gratitude to Fabio for all of his excellent leadership and organizing a, uh, a very vibrant and very dynamic group of uh, patients who are uh, sufferers, but sufferers who are taking action. And frankly, taking action is part of the therapy of any condition. Um, and I admire you for organizing yourselves. And um, I'm grateful for everything that you do to increase awareness and education. Um, a couple of points of background. For those who don't know, I, I'm a vitreoretinal surgeon and uh, I've been treating eye diseases for 34 years, um, limiting my practice to uh, surgery and pharmacotherapy of vitreous macula and retina. And the reason that we're here today is because vitreous is the gel that fills the center of the eye and that's the origin of the visual phenomenon of floaters which are shadows that are cast upon the retina by opacities in the vitreous body. And so the vitreous requires treatment in various diseases, but the phenomenon of floaters has previously not been considered a disease by the medical profession. And that is the source of your frustration. That is the difficulty that you experience when seeing doctors who don't really understand your condition and tend to push things away that uh, they don't understand. And I was guilty of that myself for, for many years. And it results in a fairly insensitive and callous perspective on your problem. And it takes a lot of time and effort to change people's minds, especially something as conservative and traditional as medicine. But movements such as this can make headway and can make a, a significant impact on people's perceptions uh, and their strength in numbers. So as your organization, as our organization grows, you'll see a, a greater impact. When Fabio and I started this project, the intent was first and foremost, education and public awareness, bringing to people's consciousness the uh, issue of floaters and how not all floaters are benign, that there are conditions where it's truly a disease. And that's the reason that we came up with the name vision degrading myodysopsia, 
it's not an easy term to say, but uh, it's intentionally technical because it sounds like a disease. And that's the first step in the paradigm shift that has to occur before the doctors and nurses in the world accept this as a disease. So it has a name and we're trying to focus all of our efforts on better understanding uh, vision degrading myodysopsia, we call it VDM for short, and to develop new diagnostics that will enable new therapeutics. The <coughs> research efforts that we're undertaking are, <coughs> excuse me, very, um, very important. Um, because it furthers our uh, mission, which was education and public awareness. The fundraising aspects have become very important, but I hasten to emphasize that when we started, we really wanted to uh, meet an unmet need, which was uh, an improved understanding of vitreous and vitreous floaters and the cases of vision degrading myodysopsia that are uh, uh, the suffering individuals uh, throughout the world. And there are many, 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 much more than you would think. We actually don't know how many, and that's one of the objectives that the VDM project wants to approach, and that is get a better understanding of how prevalent this condition is. And I'll touch upon that uh, a little bit later. But from education and public awareness, we've extended to fundraising, which has become an important aspect of what we do. And again, I congratulate you and uh, particularly Fabio for attaining the goals in December and January and uh, raising the bar for the future. That's quite commendable to uh, not be satisfied with success, but to seek uh, greater success. And uh, the sufferers worldwide will be the beneficiaries of your, of your efforts. The, the um, first area that I want to address this morning uh, is the area of publications. And the reason is that you may have uh, recently received the final version of a publication called Vitreous and Vision Degrading Myodysopsia. This is a 41 page double columned article with uh, three dozen uh, figures and videos and uh, over 400 uh, references that was published in a journal called Progress in Retinal and Eye Research. The um, importance of this publication cannot be overstated. The first reason is that vitreous in general has been overlooked. And uh, that is the reason we understand less about vitreous than perhaps any other part of the eye. I, I often quip by saying that uh, people tend to look through vitreous rather than look at vitreous. And so much of the work that I've done over the last three, four decades has been to directly focus one's attention on vitreous and consider its role in health and disease. And in fact, that's the title of the book that we published in 2014, which was 925 pages long. That's really a large book on something that people tend to overlook and not consider. But the point was that it's actually very important in terms of the health of the eye and in terms of diseases that develop, uh, vision degrading myodysopsia being one of those diseases. So the publication of the recent article is important because that particular journal is the number one impact factor journal in the world. It's a journal of review articles that are by invitation only. And so to be invited to write an article on vitreous demonstrates an increased appreciation for vitreous uh, amongst the leaders in the field. That's very good. To then have the title of the article include the term vision degrading myodysopsia, I believe is a major step forward because it means that at the very highest level of academic medicine in ophthalmology, that term is now accepted. And it starts to do what we set out to achieve, which is bring to people's awareness the importance of vitreous. And in particular, when you have opacities in the vitreous, the existence of a disease called vision degrading myodysopsia. 
So for that to be in print in the top journal in the world is a major milestone. And I realized that a lot of the technical aspects of the article may be um, beyond your uh, understanding or appreciation, but it, I present it to you because it should show you that there's a tremendous foundation in science to everything that we're talking about and everything that we're working on. And that the, the uh, concept of floaters of the past needs to be replaced by our current concept, which is based on the molecular biology and the pathology that we recognize. Uh, but also the article points out needs for future research and uh, avenues that can be pursued. So I'm really very pleased to have finally produced a corrected version of that article and for it to be out in the world. And I made it available to you uh, to disseminate to doctors and uh, um, agencies and various organizations and leaders throughout the world because it validates what you're concerned about. When you get confronted with ignorance or um, insensitivity uh, or a lack of appreciation for what you're talking about, uh, you can present this article as a summary of the world's literature, as a summary of the understanding that we have in 2020 with respect to vitreous and uh, vision degrading myodysopsia. And it'll help to break down the barriers. But there are more coming. In the next few months, I'll similarly be sending you uh, articles that are published. Um, the one that's probably coming next will be an editorial uh, that was published by the American Journal, uh, the American Academy of Ophthalmology. The title of that editorial is Vitrectomy for Vision Degrading Myodysopsia. So once again, this is a publication in a very, by a very prestigious organization, the American Academy of Ophthalmology. They have accepted the term vision degrading myodysopsia to be in an editorial. And they have invited us to write this editorial, all of which are very prestigious, all of which mean that maybe we're starting to shift. Maybe we're succeeding in getting people to accept the concept that this is important, that it afflicts a lot of people and that it deserves consideration and further research and further development to be able to improve the lives of individuals who suffer from this. So uh, having a guest editorial published by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, where the concept and the name vision degrading myodysopsia is another little milestone that, that I'm very pleased we were able to achieve. The following publication is in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, a, a prestigious one of its own right on myopic vitreopathy. And it really addresses, I believe, the concern of most of you because you tend to be younger individuals and uh, myopia, nearsightedness, is the cause for floaters and vision degrading myodysopsia in young individuals. So I think it's gonna have particular relevance to people like you and maybe the people that you reach out to because let's face it, the web-based approach is more successful in younger people than it is in older people who are less comfortable and less versatile uh, with computers and the internet, uh, et cetera. So your audience or your target population will tend to be younger and will tend to be suffering from floaters due to myopia as opposed to due to aging, which is the actually the major cause of uh, uh, floaters in at least my clinical practice, but that might be influenced by who comes to my office. It's not a population-based uh, assessment. So the, the thing about uh, myopia that's so very important is because there's currently an epidemic of myopia globally. It's, uh, it's most prominent in Asia, but it's been estimated that by the year 2050, there'll be five billion people in the world with myopia. And if the vitreous changes that we're seeing in myopic individuals today uh, exist in those individuals, they're gonna be a lot more sufferers 
who complain of disturbed vision due to vitreous opacities related to myopia and myopic vitreopathy. And so, it, you know, as successful as vitrectomy is and as safe as vitrectomy is, it's not going to be possible to perform vitrectomies on such a large number of individuals globally. And we need to have better solutions that are less invasive, less costly, but equally effective uh, to manage this uh, explosion that's going to, to occur. So to that end, I'm looking forward to the publication of the article uh, that describes how the vitreous changes in myopic individuals and how that causes vision degrading uh, myodysopsia. And uh, there too, the title of that article includes the term vision degrading myodysopsia, another achievement by us, which I'm I'm proud to share. But what that's going to do is enable me to approach some task forces that have been formed, one by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, but there are also some international organizations that are interested in myopia and that are uh, approaching this problem of the explosion that I alluded to earlier. So I'm hoping to be able to convince the task force and the international organizations that are concerning themselves with myopia that they need to think about vitreous as well. Because here too, they tend to disregard vitreous as being important in the myopic eye. And that's not true, certainly not true from this perspective. And it's, it's another example of doctors uh, thinking they know everything and not really listening to patients who are telling them what the problem is they just don't understand it, they just don't appreciate it. But I think that with this publication, there'll be a scientific basis for, for me to begin to change their minds and to hopefully get them to start thinking about vitreous in the context of um, myopia. The, uh, the future publications that we're working on involve um, what happens to the vitreous in older individuals when it collapses, a phenomenon called PVD, posterior vitreous detachment, and how that moves with uh, different body positions. And you've all experienced, if you have a PVD, um, that turning your head or driving and moving your eyes back and forth, uh, but also the erect position versus the supine position induce changes in the position of the vitreous and that's never been studied. And so we made measurements using ultrasound and uh, have an article to put together that um, we are um, going to uh, submit for publication in 2021. The last manuscript that we're working on, or we're working on the data analysis and soon to begin working on the manuscript is a better understanding of how lens status influences contrast sensitivity function and the phenomenon of floaters. By lens status, I mean, you're all aware that the eye has a lens and it's clear when you're young and as you get older, it opacifies and eventually it develops uh, sufficient opacification to merit the diagnosis of cataract. And cataract surgery is performed worldwide very successfully. It's probably the most successful operation in all of uh, medicine, it's uh, widely uh, performed. And when the lens is removed, it's replaced by a plastic lens called an intraocular lens or an IOL. And there are many different types of IOLs and without getting into the details, we did a study to analyze how the different types of intraocular lenses can influence vision, contrast sensitivity function and patient well-being and happiness from the perspective of vision degrading myodysopsia. So that's going to be a very useful thing because it reaches a wider audience, meaning the group of individuals in the world who perform vitrectomies or who are vitreoretinal specialists is much, much smaller than the group of individuals who treat lens problems, specifically cataracts and perform cataract surgery. So getting the message out, to a larger group of doctors globally is going to help our movement, is going to help the project uh, impact more doctors' opinions uh, throughout the world. And uh, it's an exciting avenue to pursue uh, on behalf of the sufferers from, from floaters. 
So those are going to be important uh, things that we work on in 2021. It's probably going to spill over to uh, 2022. Last area that I want to address before we open this up for general discussion, uh, questions and answers, is the area of R&D. What are we working on this year and uh, in the coming years? Um, we're going to be shifting structurally. Uh, up until now, we've met lots of patients in our uh, clinical practice and uh, performed uh, research analyses by measuring contrast sensitivity function and doing quantitative ultrasonography. Um, but the platform of evaluations that we are employing is expanding, and I'll mention that in a moment. What I'm planning to do is open Saturday research clinics, meaning limit Monday to Friday clinics for uh, clinical evaluations of people who have problems of various types. Uh, there are three doctors in my institute and we see patients on, on different days. But I think I'm going to open Saturday clinics so that we can isolate research patients, spend more time with each one and do more testing. And in that regard, what we're developing is a measure of the ability to read both accuracy and uh, speed and um, continue developing the, the questionnaire that I alluded to earlier that we've spoken about in the past. It's a floater specific questionnaire that ultimately will probably be putting online, maybe on, on the uh, vdmresearch.org uh, website to make it available to people worldwide. Um, that can serve multiple purposes. Uh, first and foremost, I believe the, the greatest value would be for people to evaluate themselves at home and determine how they compare to hundreds and eventually thousands of other people who have completed the questionnaire. And uh, that can be very useful information for an individual because you don't really know how bad is your condition. And this will be one way for people to uh, do self-assessment and get comparisons to a database with many other people who um, can, can um, help individuals understand their situation without necessarily going to a doctor who may or may not have uh, an interest in vitreous and may or may not have an understanding of uh, the problem, uh, et cetera. But in terms of an outcome measure, uh, how do we evaluate new treatments? This is going to be a useful thing is to, to get this questionnaire, to get the ability to read. And then there'll be other things we've spoken about before, the influence of ambient lighting and how can we measure visual function in different types of lighting. So the establishment of a Saturday research clinic on a weekly basis is going to enable us to uh, spend more time with each individual um, and not have it uh, diluted, so to speak, by, by other clinical care that's being rendered at, at the same time. Even though we've been really successful for many years in, in doing it in that way. But I think that it's, it's another byproduct of the shift of emphasis and the growing importance of vitreous research uh, in the world, um, but specifically in our world. And so um, I think that's going to be a very useful thing. In previous meetings, we've discussed the issue of um, atropine therapy, and we've decided to um, investigate the um, potential of using low-dose atropine eye drops to alleviate some of the symptoms of uh, VDM. And uh, we would like to do objective measurements of reading speed, uh, obviously, we'll get the floaters questionnaire uh, as a baseline, uh, reading speed as a baseline, contrast sensitivity function as a baseline. Uh, and we'll also be doing some studies on the pupil itself and uh, then administering the low dose atropine and then repeating measurements to see whether there is an improvement subjectively that we can quantify with the floaters questionnaire whether there's an improvement in reading accuracy and speed, whether there's an improvement in contrast sensitivity function uh, to determine whether this is potentially a useful way 
to, to treat patients who are complaining of, of these uh, problems. We're also going to be working closely with a French uh, technology company that has developed a, a new ultrasound probe that incorporates five probes into one. So it increases the sensitivity of the um, technology significantly. And uh, we're going to be getting one of those systems. It's going to be optimized by our colleagues who are acoustic engineers at Columbia University in New York and at Riverside Research also in New York. And once they've optimized it for the types of applications that we are interested in, we'll be using that um, probably initially in the research clinic and maybe ultimately in the, in the general uh, clinic uh, during the week, but we'll, we'll figure those logistics out. The point is that the company is going to make that available to us and we're gonna be able to use it in various settings. The setting that they're most interested in um, is going to be a setting of uh, evaluating YAG laser vitreolysis to treat cases of vitreous floaters. And as many of you know, I have not uh, sanctioned or supported the um, use of YAG laser vitreolysis because in reviewing the world's literature and considering all the data that's available, there has never been any scientific evidence that uh, it works. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means that the way it's been done um, has not resulted in any proof that it works. And so we're going to be setting up a project in collaboration with colleagues in London, where we're going to be performing the same protocol of evaluation and uh, treatment to determine whether or not uh, YAG laser treatments are effective and uh, if they are effective, in which subtypes of individuals are they effective? So that it would begin to introduce a, um, an alternative to the treatment of patients with VDM uh, using something less invasive than uh, vitrectomy. So we're going to be embarking on that this year. It'll probably extend next year and the year after. And uh, it's exciting because it offers uh, Europeans the opportunity to go to London if they want to participate in that study. It offers Americans the opportunity to come to California, but Asians as well. I've had a number of people come from Asia complaining of these types of problems uh, who have sought and received care uh, in California. So I think using London and, and California as our uh, two centers for this approach is, is going to be uh, useful. I continue to have discussions with other industry leaders that um, are interested in this space, trying to stimulate R&D in that uh, domain. Um, they haven't gotten as advanced as the project that I just described to you, but things will hopefully advance in, in the coming months uh, to a point where we'll have projects with them as well. Uh, and then the last thing I want to mention is that uh, I have helped four different groups uh, submit grants to different agencies to the NIH. And I think I mentioned this at our last meeting, the NIH of the United States has received one grant application. We should find out in the next two or three months whether that's been approved. We've submitted a grant to the EU um, <clears throat> an application to the EU uh, to develop optical coherence tomography, which is an imaging modality that's based upon the use of lasers, uh, very successful in evaluating the retina for 15 plus years now, maybe 20 almost, but uh, not successful in evaluating vitreous. So it requires a technologic shift in focus, no pun intended, but it is applicable and uh, imaging of the vitreous body in three dimensions with quantification. It's a potentially very powerful tool. And I've worked with optical engineers in Poland and in Spain to develop that. And uh, together as a consortium, we've submitted a grant application to the EU. We've also submitted a grant application to the Ministry of Health in Poland for the group uh, there 
Um, and then the last grant application uh, is a result of my collaboration with the uh, pharmaceutical scientists at the University of Ghent in uh, Belgium. And uh, a uh, grant application has been submitted to further the approach using nanotechnology to develop new treatments for vitreous opacities in patients with vision degrading myodysopsia. So it's a very ambitious program, I think. It's robust and I think it's relevant and gaining momentum. Uh, so there are very, very good reasons, well-founded in science and in clinical medicine to support all of the things that interest us and to um, use for the improvement of public awareness and public education, but also to raise funds to support this work because um, it won't happen without uh, support and it won't happen quickly without major support. So although things take time, we are seeing progress rather quickly in my opinion, and that's uh, to the credit of Fabio and all of you for your efforts and for your continued organization and collaboration. And I commend you and I thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Sebag. Uh, I was taking notes uh, during the, the presentation. This is very impressive because uh, if I think where we were one year ago when we started, it was just me and you and a couple of brave uh, sufferers that believed that this project was going to be different. This project is going to be the one that uh, solved this issue. So I always say this is a marathon. And I'm very glad that during this marathon, uh, more and more talented people are joining us. So if you're watching this video in a replay and you have talent to help us in any way in creating content, uh, uh, connecting with authorities uh, and create networks for this amazing project to, to, to connect with people that believe that this is possible, please join us in the mastermind group because uh, the video you're watching now is uh, a mastermind that we are doing on a monthly basis and there are people right now in the room that you may not see in the in the video now because the replay catches the one that talks but in the chat we are seeing a lot of questions and we're gonna do some Q&A right now so I'm gonna end the mic again to uh, Zach this time because uh, uh, Dr. Sebag is mentioning me, uh, but I want to mention all the amazing people that are working in this project. I just coordinate and lead as much as, as, as the best as I can, but uh, there are other leaders and people that are doing amazing things. So, Zach, can you activate your mic? Can you talk? Let me know. Of course, yeah, no problem at all. And uh, Dr. Okay. Sebag, uh, I'd like to say thank you, obviously, on behalf of everybody and so much for the uh, the dedication and the work that you've uh, you've put in so far. And obviously the, the huge achievement of your journal as well, which is a, a monumental success. So uh, I think that's brilliant, brilliant news. And uh, we're very excited to share with everybody in the newsletter soon. Okay. Well, thank you, Zach. Appreciate your efforts in that regard. Excellent. No problem. So we've got a uh, we've got a few questions in the chat here. So from Christian. Um, so there's uh, what people have seen online is a, a collaboration um, with Felix, who is working on the X floaters project, if I'm correct. Um, and Christian asked if you had any updates about um, uh, the research that's taking place, maybe the way that you guys are uh, working together and uh, the relationship that you have with them. Right. I have a very close relationship with the group at the University of Ghent. In fact, I went there in um, 2018 and I lectured to the faculty at the uh, School of Pharmaceutical Sciences and had meetings with the various researchers there to find out what their uh, lab uh, capabilities are and uh, spoke about different possible collaborations that we could develop. And since that time, we have worked on uh, using their nano bubble uh, 
approach to the treatment of vitreous. I suppose that, that it's important to understand the way this R&D develops. Uh, an idea arises sometimes from patients, sometimes from uh, students, sometimes from unexpected sources, but an idea arises. And the first thing that's done to test that uh, hypothesis is typically in vitro, meaning it's either in dishes or in some sort of uh, experimental situation in a laboratory. And if results are positive and it's shown that the hypothesis is correct. In this instance, the hypothesis was that structures inside the vitreous body can be broken up uh, using nano bubble uh, technology uh, and a laser. Um, and we tested that hypothesis in vitro. And the paper that you're aware of that the world became aware of our work uh, was published and it showed that we could indeed break up uh, models using collagen taken from the tail of a rat and put it into uh, a um, artificial vitreous situation and then use the nanobubbles and do the laser. We were able to successfully break that up, but then also capacities that I removed at surgery from patients with vision degrading myodysopsia, I sent those samples to Belgium and they were able to use that technology and showed that in the vitreous of these individuals, there were opacities that they could break up. And that further proved the hypothesis that that was a, uh, an effective approach. The next stage is you shift from in vitro to in vivo, meaning you have to show that you can do the same thing in a living organism. And you don't want to start with people right away. So, so animal models are typically what's done next. And the purpose of the animal models is to determine whether what was successful in vitro in the laboratory in the dish, so to speak, can be done in a living organism. At the same time, you can test for safety, meaning you can determine whether there are any ill effects to any of the other structures surrounding the vitreous body by this injection of the uh, particles, the nanoparticles and the use of the laser, et cetera. That phase has been completed now with collaborators at the University of Michigan in the United States. And uh, they've performed studies on rabbits and uh, we're evaluating the results and we're writing a paper to um, share the results uh, with the world. So we've moved from in vitro models to in vivo models. And the next big phase would be clinical application, meaning that um, studies will be done in people uh, there's, there's a lot that needs to be worked out exactly which people and at which stage of disease and how are we going to approach it. And when you shift from animal models to humans, there's a lot of regulatory hurdles that need to be cleared before you're given permission to do uh, R&D in, in humans. And so it's going to be a longer process. I actually think that the transition from in vitro to in vivo occurred rather quickly, uh, all things considered when, when we're talking about this complex issue. Uh, I think it's gonna take longer to get to the next phase, but um, I am intimately involved in all of that work. And so um, supporting the VDM project will be indirectly supporting this project and promoting um, further R&D. Uh, this is from both Matt and Bruna. Uh, so he says, I wanted to ask Dr. Sabag about an idea of uh, sympathetic doctors forming a kind of medical advisory board. It could give us even more credibility boost to have additional doctors or scientists listed on our website. Um, so in summary, would you uh, consider a, having a, a medical advisory board for the VDM project with uh, like-minded doctors, health professionals that are also sympathetic to I flow to sufferers. Yes, of course. And, and I've, I've uh, expressed a willingness to do that in the past. Um, 
we, we have a very close collaboration with a vitreoretinal ophthalmologist in London. And I would certainly propose that individual uh, to join the board. I also have a very close collaboration with a neuro ophthalmologist at UCLA. Um, he's been on uh, several of our publications in the past. And um, I'm sure that uh, he would provide some very useful um, uh, participation, collaboration, but also uh, validation because he's a very well-known, very prominent individual in the world of academic ophthalmology. And so uh, we've worked together for many years, ever since we met at, at Harvard 40 something years ago. And so, yeah, he would be a, an additional individual. Um, and and I, I suppose I would start with those two um, and then see how it grows organically from there. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I believe that the intentions and the contributions of those two individuals would be um, appropriate and um, not, sometimes you run into problems with people who, who uh, have ulterior motives. And so we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, I don't think a very large group would be um, important, but for example, if I have success in convincing the world of myopia and the task force of the American Academy of Ophthalmology that um, is dedicated to promoting better understanding of myopia and um, uh, its impact on people's lives. If I succeed with them, maybe a member of that task force would be an individual that, that would be willing to be named as part of the advisory board for the VDM project, uh, that sort of thing. But I would be most comfortable beginning with the um, ophthalmologists in London and Los Angeles uh, in this context. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so let me condense this question. Uh, so from Roman, uh, how much, as an estimate, how much time and money do you think it would take uh, to conduct the first clinical trials on humans um, if everything proved positive and safe with the uh, toxic effects of gold particles on the retina? So if, uh, if no, no toxicity from the gold nanoparticles was found, how long would you estimate time and cost before clinical human trials? Well, I, I think it's hard to estimate um, the cost of uh, human research these days is really very high. And uh, I think that given the drain that COVID-19 has had on the uh, R&D apparatus uh, worldwide, uh, I don't really know how much is going to be available, but it's certainly something to pursue. And, and the reason that I mentioned COVID-19 is that uh, it's important to realize the team in Ghent <clears throat> is an R&D team. The, those are scientists. And they, for example, weren't even able to do the in vivo animal studies. They had to uh, connect with a group in Michigan in order to get that done. And the reason is that they're not set up to carry something from the bench to the bedside. They basically attempt to do proof of principle research and develop the intellectual property, which has been patented, and to then license that to an organization that is able to carry it to the level of clinical application. And that's typically a large technology company or a large uh, drug company or both. And I believe that that's gonna be the next step. And so the answer to your question depends upon how successful are they going to be in connecting with an organization, uh, probably a large drug company, or a company that has both a pharmaceutical division and a technology division um, to, to uh, carry this into the clinical research domain. But <clears throat> I, I think it would be a five to seven year program. 
But I think it's important for you to realize that although the ideas came from this group in Ghent and my collaboration with them has advanced their uh, work, uh, they are not prepared nor interested in taking it into the clinical uh, application world. That's gonna have to be somebody else. Uh, and whether that's a successful transition or not remains to be seen. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and finally from uh, Alistair. Um, so he's asked if, if I will have to condense this again, uh, if you would consider uh, having a Wikipedia page for yourself and or the VMR Institute. Um, Alistair works in, uh, in science himself and uh, with research, he said that they, uh, they often reference Wikipedia pages to increase awareness. Um, is this something you'd consider? Sure. I, I think that would be a useful thing. Um, again, it, it makes me smile because the, the, the reason we're all here today is because I met Fabio. And in talking to Fabio, uh, I realized that as successful as I think I have been in promoting uh, an awareness and an appreciation of vitreous in all aspects of ocular health and disease, and as successful as I think I've been in making the, the case academically and scientifically for uh, a need, as well as an initial understanding of what's going on inside the vitreous of people who are having floaters. And uh, there's numerous really, really good studies that we did and publications in very good journals, um, such as we discussed earlier, as successful as I've been in that scientific and academic uh, world of medicine, I have not been very successful in the world at large. Maybe it's a generational thing that I'm older and I'm not really as uh, appreciative of the value of social media um, in its various uh, forms. Um, and so Fabio came along with his uh, internet entrepreneur expertise. And I thought that would be a very good marriage, uh, a, a way to take uh, a modern communications uh, connectivity approach uh, and marry that with the scientific and clinical and academic uh, approach that we've taken up until now to get the word out. And so that's a long answer to saying yes to your question. Sure, Wikipedia would be an example of outreach to the world at large and provide a platform. We could, we could append our publications because they're in the public domain. You know, we could structure it in such a way. And the way I'd like that to proceed is for someone to perhaps write an initial draft, send it to me for editing, and then it can develop from there. Um, but yeah, I think it would be a very good thing. I think it'd be very much in keeping with what Fabio and I set out to do at the beginning. Wonderful, thank you. And forgive me, there's one more question that I promised somebody that I would ask. Um, and this is quite, no quite a broad I, I'm here for the duration. <laughs> Um, quite a broad question. So from Vinicius, he asked that um, if, uh, for example, somebody went to their uh, ophthalmologist or, or doctor complaining of eye floaters and they found that the, uh, the, the medical professional was quite unsympathetic, is there anything that's almost something they could have in their hand as in some sort of letter from a medical professional or yourself to say, actually, I am a, a professional ophthalmologist and I have worked with a lot of people who do suffer from eye floaters. Um, you know, we, we believe this is a genuine issue. Uh, I don't know how practical that would be in real life, but I suppose the sentiment is, um, is there something quantifiable that somebody could bring with them to an unsympathetic doctor uh, to try to change their mind? Well, <laughs> um, you can only change a mind that's open. And unfortunately, in general, you'll find nothing but a closed mind. And I think that one of the reasons I'm excited about this recent publication that I shared with all of you is that it's extraordinarily broad and detailed and referenced and legitimate scientifically and clinically and 
appears in the number one journal in the world. It's really, really hard to get into that journal. It's by invitation only. And I think it reflects very positively on the appreciation of vitreous, on the acceptance of vision degrading myodysopsia as an entity worthy of consideration, at least worthy of consideration of this magnitude. And to me, it represents a definitive validation that can be used in the context of your question. But be aware, the average ophthalmologist has probably never read this journal. The average ophthalmologist is probably uninterested, I'm sorry to say, in learning new things and in advancing and in changing their minds. You know, changing a human's mind is one of the most difficult things in the world surpassed in difficulty only by changing a human doctor's mind. Because it's, it's somehow ingrained that what you've learned in medical school is gospel and that's it. You know how little that I learned in medical school 40 years ago is used by me today in terms of specific details. And I think it's the big challenge for the medical profession to evolve and grow after school stops after you cease going to classes and being taught and, and have to undertake self-learning and self-growth. And it's probably true in other uh, professions as well. But um, as important as I might think a publication in the top journal for all the reasons I already described uh, twice might be, I'm not sure that that's going to move the um, average ophthalmologist in the community. But frankly, you don't want to be treated by the average ophthalmologist in the community because they don't have the skill that's required to deal with this. And um, I already know a handful of people in different places in the world who are sympathetic to, to my um, philosophy and to your plight. And so, you know, I can, I can, make some recommendations here and there, uh, depending upon where the individual might be. But this is an evolving thing. Uh, I hear from these people, and most often I hear them say, you know, I heard that lecture that you gave 10 years ago, and I thought you were crazy. I didn't think you made sense. But ever since then, you've got this, you've got that, you've got... And now I'm starting to change my mind and I'm starting to do surgery on some of these people. I do it very hesitantly, but you know what? It works. And the way you describe to do the surgery is effective. And little by little, this is going to catch on. I, I can tell you that I started this maybe 11 or 12 years ago, and it was really difficult for a patient to convince me to do a vitrectomy for floaters back then because of many different considerations. But with time and with more cases and with more experience, I gained more confidence and the threshold has lowered. It's easier now to identify clinically significant cases, not just because we have the tools with ultrasound and measuring contrast sensitivity function, and soon we're gonna have a reading test and we're going to have the floaters questionnaire. There'll be ways to identify true needy cases uh, with, with which to um, uh, approach a vitrectomy. Uh, <clears throat> but as they get more comfortable with this, it'll be easier. Now, do I think that every ophthalmologist in the world is gonna be measuring contrast sensitivity function? No, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. Why? Well, a lot of different factors, but again, to change the way somebody thinks and works, is a difficult thing. Uh, I think you'll find the young people who are graduating these years much more open to that than someone who graduated 20 years ago. Um, so we're living in a time of shift and the shift is going to take longer than any of us want, but that's the reality of human endeavors. And um, how can we push it? Information, give them the papers, you know, an editorial, invited by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, which I'll share with all of you. It's short, it's much shorter than the 41 page article 
Um, it delivers the same message. Uh, there was recently a letter to the editor that I published. It was only one page long and it summarized perfectly the, the legitimacy of considering vision degrading myodysopsia as a disease and, uh, and its treatment with vitrectomy. The next big wave I think is gonna be when we develop a less invasive way. Maybe ag laser, maybe femtosecond laser, maybe nanobubble therapy. Uh, that's going to make it easier for eye doctors in general to, to recommend uh, treatments and help people um, because let's face it, it's a minority of people in the world who can do a vitrectomy. It's not done by any eye doctor. You have to be very specialized and quite expert. Uh, <clears throat> so, so as you simplify things, um, you make it available to larger numbers of people. And as the experience unfolds, and I predict it will be a very positive experience, meaning no complications and um, it'll be um, effective and safe, uh, it'll be more and more accepted. Uh, but today, you know, I, I think I've said this to you before, in 2013, I gave a lecture to an organization called the Retina Society on this topic. And at the end of my lecture, the moderator asked the 400 some odd uh, retinal surgeons in the audience, uh, by show of hands, how many do a vitrectomy for floaters? And half of the people raised their hands. And what that suggested to me was that a lot of people are sensitive uh, and proactive in the sense that they offer vitrectomy to certain patients, but they don't want anybody to know about it because they consider it controversial and they don't want to be uh, targeted for criticism or in any way um, uh, have issues. So, so <clears throat> I think the willingness is there, but people proceed with caution, too much caution in some instances such as this. And uh, for now, the answer to your question is show them the papers, the long ones, the short ones, provide them with information that they probably don't have uh, because people tend not to stay up on the literature that they're not interested in. And um, hopefully that will begin to change their mind, but don't expect overnight results. Very, uh, very much understood. And uh, thank you so much for your answer. Um, uh, truthfully, that's everything from me and the questions that, uh, that we have collectively. But again, thank you so much. And uh, obviously an enormous congratulations on your publication. Uh, we're very excited to spread the news as, as much as you are. Uh, but I just want to thank you personally again for everything that you've done for us and uh, uh, we'll hopefully speak to you soon. But I will, uh, I'll pass back over to Fabio now. Thanks, guys. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sebag, for this amazing uh, conference. Uh, I think it was filled of beautiful information and a very, very good perspective on the future for this problem. I think if we all unite and get together, and connect ideas and especially raise funds to speed up uh, the research because uh, we can do our, we can, we can support the research uh, with what we can do. But I think that we, if we, we all unite and we accept that we can really make a change, uh, this project will succeed sooner than we all think. So thank you so much, Dr. Sebag again. For the, for the presentation and the details and your achievement for the publication. Please do not stop because we need you uh, leading this future uh, union of uh, ophthalmologists that want to cure and treat better uh, vitreous floaters. Thank you so much, doctors, and we talk soon. Thank you.